Folks, this is Joseph Alero. You are listening to Mage the Podcast. Boy, I'm stirring my words here. I'm a little nervous today because this is the first installment of the podcast. And let me tell you a little bit about the show. I recently got turned on to Mage the Ascension. I went out and listened to a bunch of podcasters, a podcast dedicated to Werewolf and, of course, Vampire the Masquerade and even Changeling which does not get enough love that it should, but there really isn't a podcast dedicated to Mage. And so I thought, you know what? I'm a newbie to the game. I want to learn all about it. I'm going to start the podcast myself. I am definitely not the most informed person to be doing this, but no one else is doing it, so it's up to me. And also the approach I'm taking is that when I was a kid, when I was hanging with friends in the various game rooms or people's houses playing uh, AD&D and whatnot, we would talk and they would turn me on to all sorts of other games. They would tell me like ways that they might interpret on how to play a character or cast a spell. And so that is the approach I'm going to take to this podcast. And since this is the first episode of Mage the Podcast, I thought I would talk to the game's co-creator, Satoros Bukato. So, uh, Satoros, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Thanks for having me, and thanks for doing the show. It took a little while, but uh, it finally came together <laughs> now that we got you here. I wanted to ask you, first of all, before we even sure. delve into the world of Mage, a lot of people know you as Phil Bukato, but why Satoros? Back when I was working on Changeling in 19, I think this is 96... At 95, I had written the uh, Changeling First Edition. I had written the uh, the Kith section. And when I was working on that, I was particularly drawn to the Seder Kith. And <clears throat> they just resonated with me. And I was talking to Ian about that afterward. And, and I said, you know, the whole passionate, temperamental, sometimes a little too much, you know, really intense and so forth. And I said, I, I could really relate to that. And, and Ian laughs. He said, that's because you are a satyr, Phil. Now, <laughs> I've never liked my, uh, my birth name. Uh, in fact, my father, who I'm named after, his response when he found out what he, he was in Vietnam when I was born, and when he found out that uh, uh, my mom had named him after me, he's like, God, why just give him that name? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, when I first got started writing, I, I had the whole, you know, I had the whole bullied kid, I'll show them, I'll be famous someday mentality going. So I kept my birth name, but I always wanted to change it. When Ian said, you know, you are a satyr, Phil, that became a running joke around the office. <clears throat> At one point, he had dubbed the character on the back of uh, the satyr Kith book, Philippe Lenoir and had, I think, a signature character in, in uh, Changeling called Philippe Lenoir, and you know, which which was a parody of me. And I, I had a, a picture of that up on my uh, my office wall and so forth. Also, Nikki Ray and Jackie Cassida, who were our collaborators on uh, on Mage and Changeling, were telling me about the origin of the uh, the series Immortal Eyes. And I said, "Where'd you get that name?" And Jackie's like, "Well, you've heard the Water Boys song, The Return of Pan, haven't you?" And I was like, "No." She's like, oh, I've got to fix that. That song resonated with me really, really deeply, especially as a, as a pagan sort of rec <laughs> recovering Christian pagan musician. I was like, I totally get this song. So when I left White Wolf, I was kind of looking, looking for ways to re reinvent myself. And when uh, at one point I was kind of doing the dishes and, and having this mental argument with myself, and I just had this vision of Pan throwing back his head and laughing at me and laughing at the whole situation. I was like, so that felt significant. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I had a uh, uh, my my longtime friend and collaborator Mark Jackson designed uh, a a laughing satyr tattoo for my uh, for my back. It's on my left shoulder blade, and that became the name of my studio uh, the the form that I formed co formed uh, after leaving White Wolf Laughing Pan Productions, and. I joined a, a pagan group and went to Burning Man again and, and hiked on the Appalachian Trail and so forth, going under the name of Seder Blade because I had a Seder on my shoulder blade. That got shortened to Seder, and by about 2004, that's what most people knew me as. When I came out to Seattle, I was Clark Kenting, basically. I had kind of left the whole White Wolf thing behind. This was 2007. I didn't want to be known as that guy who used to do Mage, because I figured that was a long time ago. I want to be known for who I am now, not for what I did then. So when you know when I came out here, everybody just knew, oh, that's Seder. That's, that's Sandy's boyfriend, Seder. So S.J. Tucker, who is a, an old friend of ours, 
Suja Tucker introduced Sandy and I in, uh, at a festival in 2007. And when uh, in 2000, I believe it's 2009, she got really badly sick, wound up in the hospital with some really catastrophic medical bills. And so a bunch of us did an all hands on deck fundraising effort for her. And part of that involved Sandy, uh, my, my then girlfriend, now wife, editing a, uh, a benefit anthology called Ravens in the Library. And in order to put that book together, I pulled a lot of old strings and called on a lot of uh, old favors, at which point said, people said, holy shit, you're that guy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit, you're that guy who did Mage. <clears throat> and so people start calling me Phil again. I'm like, I really hate that name. <laughs> Please don't. You just keep calling me Seder. Naturally, when Mage 20 came along in 2012, when we started laying the groundwork for that, it was obviously you have to let people know who is this Seder guy. Oh, he's the guy who originally did Mage between 1993 and 1999. So I did a compromise and it was Soderos. My friends, uh, Antony and Haris, <coughs> Joanna and Nina in Greece dubbed me uh, Soteros when, when we were in Greece seven years ago. And uh, so Soteros Phil Bricado seemed like a workable professional name. And that's what I've been going by ever since. Sorry, that was a long answer that had very little to do with Mage. but uh, No, uh, it's very interesting. <laughs> and, you know, I, one of the reasons I find it interesting is I'm going in the opposite direction because for decades I've been known as Bazooka Joe because when I first got into radio, oh, I was very much into <laughs> yes, that's me. See, I've heard of Bazooka Joe, but I didn't realize that was you. Oh, this is funny. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> oh, well, well, the thing of it was, is when I got into radio, I was very much into punk rock and there was Sid Vicious and Johnny Rotten, but that's very British. I wanted something American in Bazooka Joe. You know, it's, it's pop. It's, uh, and I think Bazooka Joe, the character, it's had a sort of a punk rock attitude. But over the decades, what I found is people knew who Bazooka Joe was, but they didn't know who Joseph Leo was. And I felt like I missed mm -hmm. a lot of opportunities. So going forward, I'm like, all right, I'm putting Bazooka Joe to rest because I want people to know that it's Joseph Leo who's doing all these shows and doing all these interviews so there's no more confusion. So I'm, I'm going on the opposite end of you. That's funny because, I mean, I've, I've, I've been involved in punk rock since uh, 82 or 83 or so. And so I'd heard of you under Bazooka Joe. <laughs> Oh, what a small world. That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so, you know, before we go any further, because I don't want to take all, all of your uh, Saturday afternoon, but we have about 11 listeners right now on oh, Zcast, cool. which is pretty good for our first show. Yeah. Um, Hi, everybody. Thanks for people me. listening in, if you want, you can actually uh, type us messages. And if uh, we are sharp enough, we can actually respond to your messages. And if you have any questions, we'll, we'll definitely do that. And um, I actually, I have a bunch of questions that I've collected from Facebook and some friends. And I thought we'd do that towards the end of the show. But the bulk of the show really is just to explore what Mage is. And I know that's really open-ended because each storyteller has their own take of what Mage is. You, as a co-creator, you definitely have your own take of what it is. But in general, for the people who are listening who are well-versed in the game, or maybe they're like me and they're getting into the game for the first time, what exactly is Mage? Mage is a game of reality on the brink which is a very, very timely subject right now, which is one of the things that's been making Mage 20 both interesting and sometimes really difficult to write. But uh, it, it's about people who have recognized that they have the ability to, to change reality. You know, I personally believe we all have a limited degree of ability to change reality. And my, my real life actually kind of, kind of has shown that to be true. But mages can change it on a much more profound level. And the problem with the ability to change reality is everybody has different ideas of what reality should look like. So mages find themselves in conflict with each other and frequently with themselves over well, if you had the power of the, if you had this, this godlike power, what the hell would you do with it? And what would it do with you? Because as you change the world, the world changes you in return. So it's a game about power and empowerment. It's a game about belief. It's a game about consequences. It's a game about recognizing that the world is bigger than you think it is. And the tagline from age 20 is pride, power, and paradox. It's about believing in things so strongly you can change the world and being careful about how you change the world because it's going to be your, your, the effects of what you do are going to be a lot bigger than you think they are. I wanted to go back to what you said about how it changes you. And just my own experience, just I, I'm developing my own chronicle. I'm reading the rules. 
And the moment I wake up, I start thinking about the game and what I want to do and all the stuff I want to dump into it. So it's, that's already had its impact. And as far as beliefs, that's pretty interesting because we're in a very tribal state right now. Um, you have yeah. red, red state against blue states, one religious doctrine versus another religious doctrine. No, you are absolutely right. We are in the midst of it. This has been a really crazy time for being you know, in charge of a game about changing reality, and especially because there's so much of an argument. There's so many arguments right now over what, where is reality? What is reality? What is fake news? What is trolling? You know, is is that meme accurate? What does accurate mean? You know, uh, are you a libertard? Are you a snowflake? Are you a Trumpkin? You know, we've got all these words, all these names, these accusations, these visions of the world that seem to be so radically different from each other to the point where we're using the internet which is a technology that demands you know, space age resources, is spreading the idea that the world is flat. That's crazy. I that's know, that's crazy insane. That's the world is. <laughs> I, I've recently purchased Mage 20. How has the game changed in the last 20 years? Uh, at this point, it's like 25, because uh, Mage came out in uh, 1993, the original edition of Mage. I was, to, to put this into concept, I was hired after the, the first edition rulebook was written, before it went to press, uh, the original rule book was uh, was written by uh, was was conceived by Stuart and Steve Wick, uh, the the founder, two of the three founders of White Wolf Game Studio, and Chris Early and a number of people from uh, from White Wolf. Stuart's original concept for mages was that mages were would pe were people who would move the world forward uh, through uh, through their enlightenment. They would bring humanity to a uh, to to a, 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 a further advanced state, but could also freeze reality in its tracks by, by remaining stagnant, by, be, by, uh, by being static. Uh, he drew those ideas primarily from the writings of Robert Piercyk with uh, the books Lila and uh, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. Stuart was a philosopher, but as I recall, as, as I recall, was kind of an atheistic philosopher. I'm pagan and I'm a mystic. I, I've been very metaphysically inclined since I was a kid, uh, had a brief flirtation with fundamentalist Christianity in the late 70s, uh, threw that out by the end of the 70s, and uh, started exploring basically every spiritual path I could, uh, eventually kind of wound up going, oh, what the hell, dude, everything is, something's wrong with all these beliefs. Where do I find, uh, where, 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 where I recognize there's something bigger out there. And essentially what I came to without going into a lot of detail about it was, was a, uh, a pantheist start of a uh, neo-paganism when I was hired to do mage because, well, another tangent there, I'll just keep this straight. Uh, <laughs> when I, when I was hired to do mage, uh, they said, literally my boss, Ken Cliff, when I asked him, I said, how much, how much latitude do I have with this? He says, it's all yours. We don't have the slightest idea what to do with it. So I included a lot of elements of uh, resonance and consequence and the idea that reality wasn't everything that you thought it was probably my primary influence other than my own uh, my own life experiences for my vision of mage was uh, akira kurosawa's film rashomon which is about a crime which is described in hindsight from four different perspectives every one of which is completely different with mage i said all these mages all these people are going to see reality a little bit differently. That subjective reality thing was something that I uh, that, that I brought to it as well as a, as much as we possibly could, grounding it in real life history and real life metaphysics without making it uh, either an occult textbook or an insult to the uh, to the creeds and cultures involved. There was some culture fail involved anyway, but that's a whole other subject. <laughs> <laughs> it was the '90s. We didn't really have the internet yet. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, as the game evolved, I, I was being deliberately subversive with tearing everything. You know, I'd, I'd set something up and then I would contradict it, like with like with the uh, technocracy guide, uh, which uh, Jess Hennig and I did. It started out with an introduction that I wrote, which basically said everything you thought you knew about us is wrong. Classic. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I Fire Sign Theater was also a big influence. Uh, on a huge fan, huge fan, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, so when I left the line for a variety of reasons, which basically boiled down to I was burnt out, I left in transition from, from uh, 90, uh, 98 and through 99 and Jess Hedig took over. And Jess, 
unfortunately got caught in between a um, in between a number of circumstances that that kept him from making the line the way he would have liked to have done it uh, because of some uh, market issues that were going on at the time. Uh, White Wolf was going very was was going very heavily in a what will sell the most books possible so we can stay in business, and so Jess got handed of a a mandate of we're going to do this with Mage and you're going to do it or else. And so what the vision of Mage that Jess got handed was magic lost. You're you're now you know you're you're now running in the shadows trying to survive, and a lot of people got really angry about that. And so there was this huge division rift between um, Mage First and, and uh, the, the Mage First and Second editions, which I had done, and the and Mage Revised, which Jess was doing for a while, and then Bill Bridges uh, took over when Jess left. Some people really, really love Revised. Some people really, really hate Revised. Some po- some people really love First and Second, and some people really hate First and Second. When Rich Thomas and I started talking in 2012 about what do we do for Mage 20, we, we agreed we wanted to do a Mage for all Mage fans. One of my primary design parameters was making it, was healing the edition wars, was making it so that Mage 20 was something that anybody who enjoyed, if you enjoyed first, you could do this. If you enjoyed second, you could do this. If you enjoyed revised, you could do this. And something that bridged all those editions rather than, rather than dictated that one was right and the others were wrong. Also, I wanted to bring Mage forward. Mage was a very, it was a very up to the minute game in 1993. (laughs) <laughs> its vision of the the internet it, it's it, the, the the factions involved the, the the technocracy the whole nine yards were very very early 90s and i said you know within the bounds of maintaining the intellectual property that is you know not completely throwing everything out and starting over again what can i do to make this a game of 2013 not 1993 and so i so i did that with uh updating technology updating uh, a lot of the, the social and political conversations we've been having these last few years things about you know gender politics uh faith identity that were really not things that were even talked about back in the 90s or in ways they were not talked about back in the 90s bringing the conversation forward and making it so that mage and this is also a primary uh, design parameter for me with 20th uh, with with uh, the the 20th materials emphasizing that Mage is not the game we give you. Mage is the game that you make out of what we give you. I find this really interesting because I have this conversation with people about uh, books and movies and games where there's a definitive version for them and they get very upset when it changes. And I'll give an example. One of the games I've always played was Traveler. This classic Traveler. And yeah. this new era, and <laughs> people get edition wars. <laughs> yeah, people get very upset about it. But I'm like, you know what? Classic Traveler never went away. You can still play that game. And I sort of see that with Mage. Again, I'm new to Mage, but it's like if you like Mage, the first version, it hasn't gone anywhere. You can still play that game. Here's another thing I wanted to ask you about, and I know you're about to uh, explore another thought, but from what I understand, Mage has always been slightly subversive. The fact that you had an (laughs) African-American on the cover, that there were people who were identified as queer. You said you wanted to bring it up to date for the 21st century. So Mm -hmm. in that aspect, how has that changed? One of the primary ways, and it's, this isn't really a change so much as it's been an updating, has been the uh, the role of gender and identity. Half the White Wolf stuff, and I'm I'm, I'm not going to I'm not going to out anybody, but I mean half half the folks involved with White Wolf were queer in some way or another, and myself included. That's not something that's radically different, but the ways that language that we use, the terminology, the way that we view, there there was no discussion back then about non-binary identity that the term didn't exist the idea of gender and its role in society that's changed tremendously since the 1990s the role of of uh, transhumanism was was something that a handful of people were were talking about in silicon valley in the early 90s now it's a uh, it, it now it's a, a small but increasingly significant element of, uh, of popular culture and, and, and technology. Uh, technology obviously has changed and our ability, our, our thoughts of what is real have changed. Also, a, a major thing that the internet has done both for uh, uh, both positively and negatively is the internet has given access and a voice and a face to people all over the world. Anybody who has an internet connection now 
can get online and can create things and can comment on things. Uh, that has lots of positive and negative effects. But social media, as we know it, is is a fundamental element of, of our era, and it didn't exist until the late 1990s. I mean, there were there was online. I mean, the World Wide Web went online in 1991. There were various iterations of of, uh, of the internet before that, but but the idea that anybody with a smartphone, anybody with a phone in their pocket, could access the internet from anywhere in the world as long as they had reception, that anybody with the right software could create movies, and to a, a, a greater extent, could change the way that we viewed the world. That's huge, and that's an element that's been a primary element of, of Mage Twenty. Uh, the idea that it's not it's not just a bunch of white dudes you know, sitting around their computers or, um, or rich white guys with money and power dictating reality. It's that anybody can change our view of reality. Anybody can access it for better and worse. On one hand, you have YouTube where somebody can record a song and, and become world famous. On the other hand, you have ISIL or you have Donald Trump or, or you have the alt-right where somebody with that exact same access can do horrible and potentially world-ending things. Right now, we have 21 listeners live on Zcast. So hi, if at any point – hi, everybody. If at any point any of you want to participate, if you have a question or if you want to say something to Sateros, uh, you can just uh, type a message and we'll get it and we will respond. Here are some of the questions I have. And just to let you know, Sateros, some of them are mage-related and some of them mm -hmm. are vampire-related. Uh, so – just sure. keep that in mind. All right, so this okay. one is from Chris, and this is from the Chris. Facebook White Wolf RPGs Gameplay and Media Group. And his question is, will both Gods and Monsters and the Book of the Fallen be released this year? That's the plan. Gods and Monsters has been turned into the publisher, but there are still like eight steps that need to happen. So probably, yes. Book of the Fallen, I'm still writing. And, and what happened last year was I lost three people, including one of my best friends, who I was also a caretaker for, and my long-term girlfriend, Coyote, who I'd been involved with for 12 years, died of cancer. Uh, I'm sorry. Kind of caretaker for, thank you. I was kind of a caretaker for her as well. And then Stuart Wick, who was the, uh, you know, the, the co-creator, or the, basically the creator of Mage, he died as well. He died suddenly. Raven, my friend, and Coyote did not. And the combination of those three things and some other factors, including arthritis in my back, really, really took a lot out of me last year. And so things fell behind, but I'm working very hard to catch up on them now. And Book of the Fallen is, is rolling right along. And like I said, uh, Gods and Monsters has been turned in. Before we go to the next question, what exactly is Gods and Monsters and Book of the Fallen? The full title is Gods, Monsters, and Familiar Strangers. And that is uh, essentially a book of, of creatures and companions for Mage. Uh, it's huge. It's bigger than an old school player's guide, and it's close to the size of an old school rule book, actually. And it deals with the idea that it, it it deals with the idea of that the people the people. Okay, so mages <laughs> often mages often look at the rest of the world as oh the masses, oh the sleepers. We're the ones who are really in charge. We're the ones who really matter. And Gods and Monsters says, yeah, fuck no. The rest of the world matters too, and so it's it has got a, a large section on ordinary people. Uh, it's got a large section of various god forms, ranging from uh, from Anasi and uh, and the uh, the Loa uh, to Jesus. <laughs> um, I, I expect there'll be a lot of pushback on that one, but I, I felt that was kind of important. It's got vampires and it's got werewolves and it's got cyborgs and familiars and avatar spirits. And, and then it's got a big character creation uh, chapter at the end, uh, at the end of the book where it's okay. So you want to make a, you want to make a familiar, you want to make a consort, you want to make a, you know, a, a character who is not a mage and run them in mage. Here's here are the rules for that. Uh, it sort of, picks up where the bygone bestiary and um, Ascension's right hand uh, left off, but they left off in the 90s, and this brings it this brings it forward. The Book of the Fallen is the Book of Nefandi, and that has been a both a very easy and a hard book to write because I feel on a lot of levels we're kind of living in an age where the idea of the death of empathy is definitely a is a, again a potentially life ending possibility. 
Uh, I'm not going to go too far into that just to answer that. It's, it's a book of <laughs> Nefandi. It's a book of Nefandi and it's really fucking dark. <laughs> next question. <laughs> All right. For the next question, we already touched upon this, but maybe you can feel free to expound upon this. This is from Turco and he wants to know, how do you feel hey, the themes and ideas presented in White Wolf games, especially in Mage, have changed in the last 20 years and which ones are still relevant and which ones are the most important going forward? Okay, well, one of the big things that changed is we were a bunch of kids when we wrote that shit in the 90s. <laughs> we're all middle-aged now. <laughs> <laughs> we we were a bunch we were a bunch of kids you know who were just you know kicking back at authority because we could um uh, and so the 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 the, I, the the primary themes of white wolf back in the especially in the early 90s was rebellion and subversion that's still a major theme of the world of darkness but we're addressing it with a bit more depth and nuance and and cultural understanding than we did back then um other primary themes of the world of darkness, which are still relevant, are the ideas of re- that the idea that re- that reality is relevant, the uh, relative rather, uh, the idea that reality changes depending, <laughs> what is true changes depending from your depending on your perspective, who's looking at what from where, uh, and that while some things are universally true, if you drop this ball, it will fall and hit the ground. The reason for why it might be true, or did you drop the ball, or was it already on the ground, or maybe open to debate. Those themes are still very prevalent. The theme that you are the monster was and remains a core idea in the world of darkness. And I think that was probably the most revolutionary thing that, uh, uh, that, that Mark, Mark Reinhagen brought to gaming was the idea of your, you know, that the monster is you, and that that's actually you know something you should take a look at it's it's significant it was uh, it was a major change in terms of a, a major break from role playing games in the 80s and i think as the uh uh as the internet has given us the ability to affect the world on a greater scale i think it's even more important that we look at our our potential to be monsters and be careful what we do with that uh because otherwise we'll destroy ourselves that's pretty that, that's pretty clear Things that have changed, uh, the environmental the the environmentalist element that was very prevalent in in Werewolf and to a lesser degree in Mage and Changeling, is even more important than it was back then. And one of the things that we another uh, theme that we brought to the table back in the uh, back in the nineties that's even more I think important. Uh, than it used to be was the idea of representation and diversity. Back when we were doing this in the early 90s, with with the exception of Travis Williams, Mark Jackson, and uh, and a few other people, we were all white. We were all white folks. Not all white guys, but we were all white folks. We made a number of mistakes. We made a number of really, really offensive <coughs> Akashic Brotherhood <coughs> mistakes. <laughs> uh, and now that the internet and social media have given us an opportunity to reach outside of the people we knew when we were 25 to work on the books to write with the books and to consult on the books we now have a much a much wider range of accurate uh, cultural and gender and and creed diversities than than we had back then and i think especially right now that is absolutely vital uh, that's been a primary thing for me with Mage as well, uh, both back then and especially now. Uh, the kind of mistakes we made 25 years ago are just not acceptable anymore. And so we work hard to not do that. <laughs> Before we move on to our next question, uh, Lobo just chimed in and Lobo says that uh, hey, he loves the second edition of Mage. Thank you. Our next question comes from Stelios, and this is also from the Facebook hey, White Wolf RPGs Game Play and Media Group. Uh, his question, and there may be a typo here, uh, maybe his uh, phone didn't do a correct autocorrect here, but the question is, is there a new edition coming out along with Vampire and War- Werewolf? And if yes, and this is a part that might be a, t- a typo, if yes, does the fluff change at all? If no, will there be eventually? Cheers. That is a question for somebody else <laughs> that's so the, the the situation the really short version of the complicated situation is white wolf white wolf the company that i used to work for in the 90s no longer exists we were bought out by cc we, we were brought out by ccp and ccp bought the intellectual property rights from the company that is now uh that is now called white wolf their plans are not something i'm part of uh i may be working with them i've been talking with them but i work for onyx path publishing onyx path publishing spun off from ccp 
when CCP closed the White Wolf division and Onyx Path Publishing is made up largely of, of former White Wolf people formed by Richard Thomas, who was one of the original founders of, uh, of, of the White Wolf. He was, he was involved in White Wolf magazine, was one of the founders of, of White Wolf Game Studios. In the 90s, he formed Onyx Path Publishing. He and I have been friends and have worked together for 20-something years. He's the person I work with. That question is a question for the folks in Sweden who own the intellectual property rights. I can't answer that one. This is one of the reasons why I wanted to do this show, because I had no idea about the history of Onyx Path. So you just answered a, a question that's been in the back of my mind for like the last couple of months. Onyx Path licenses the intellectual property rights from White Wolf, which is in Sweden, which is a division of Paradox Interactive. Before we move on to our next question, uh, once again, if you are listening to the show on Zcast, feel free to participate. You can text us the message and we will respond if you want to. Oh, and Mosquito says, hi, guys, or hey, guys. So <laughs> hey to you, Mosquito. Hola. So our next question, uh, this comes from Simon, who is one of the co-hosts for Changeling, the uh, wander, uh, Wandering Away from the Dream. From Arcadia. I believe that's, yeah. From Arcadia. Uh, that is a, such an like, excellent Arcadia. podcast. Yeah, it really is. Yeah, it's it's almost academic in scope. Oh, they would love to have you, I'm sure. They're old friends of mine, so yeah. (laughs) We've talked about it. I've I've been really, really busy the last few months, so I just haven't gotten on it yet. But sorry, go ahead. This is Simon's question. And again, this is another topic we uh, uh, talked about earlier, but feel free to expand on it. Um, Simon says that Mage was originally somebody else's baby. What was Mm -hmm. picking up that project like? And if somebody told you you'd be doing it again 20 years later, would you have believed them? That is an excellent question. <laughs> well, that's Simon for you. Thank you, Simon. Uh, so, um, let's see. I'll try not to spend 20 minutes answering this one. <laughs> um, it was really intimidating at the beginning. I mean, I'd been working for White Wolf as a freelancer for about a year when I got hired to to, uh, to handle Mage. A thing that, and this, this is actually ties into a tangent that I started going on and stopped uh, about 25 minutes ago. The founders of White Wolf, Mark Reinhagen, Stuart Wick, and Steve Wick, had a really good idea when they founded the group, was, which was, or when they founded the studio, which was that they and you know, their, their inner circle would create the primary rule book for the game, and then they would hire somebody to be the, the line developer. That person at that point would have near total creative control, you know, over the books, over the direction of the line, over, you know, to a degree, the art would deal with the fans and so forth. And from that point, they kept a hands off approach. And for the first few of us line developers, they did that. Andrew Greenberg, who a vastly underrated person in terms of White Wolf and in terms of gaming in general. Andrew's name and contribution to gaming does not get mentioned nearly enough. When Vampire the Masquerade first appeared, it was a sort of a literary take on D&D. It was Andrew Greenberg who brought in the elements uh, of politics and subversion that have become such a uh, such a primary element of uh, the world of darkness. So Andrew got near full creative control. When Bill Bridges, my old friend and roommate from college, got brought in as White Wolf, he was essentially, you know, handed the White Wolf, uh, the Werewolf, rather, um, a first edition rule book and said, go ahead, do whatever you want with it. And and he did. And that's when uh, when I was hired for Mage, uh, when Ken told me, you know, it's it's all yours. We don't, we, have this, we don't have the slightest idea what to do with it. Steve and Stuart and Ken and Mark kept a hands-off attitude. Every once in a while, especially in the early days, I would go to Stuart and go, okay, what did you mean by this? Or what did you want from this? What did, what did you, what were the things that you desired from the game? And Stuart's usual answer, which was amazing, really, in terms of creative control and creators in general, was, it's your game. This is what I meant but it's yours now. Do what you want with it. That was a profound gift. Uh, I wrote after Stuart's, excuse me a moment. So after Stuart's death last year, um, I wrote a piece about that on my blog, about how that was literally a life-changing and some elements life-saving gift for me, being hired and being hired to do mage and being given that level of, that level of, of creative freedom, which was fairly unreal in terms of um, uh, work for hire situations. Stuart, like I said, changed my life and on some level saved it. I was not in a good place before uh, before that. That's a long story. I'm not going to go into that right now. But in any case, it was huge. Something else I learned as the first few years that I was doing Mage were pretty frantic <laughs> because our, our release schedule was 10 books a year. So it was absurdly... Uh, uh, absurdly hectic, but something I, I started 
realizing around 1995 was that the stuff we were doing had a really profound effect. You know, we were treating it, and I mean, it was. It was role-playing games, and which role-playing games, you know, in the, in the, the 70s and 80s were com- seemed completely disposable. By the time, by about the mid-90s, we started realizing people were taking what we were doing seriously. And so some of us, uh, myself, Jennifer Hartshorn, uh, Sam Chupp, uh, Bill Bridges, uh, you know, several others started taking it a lot more seriously as well and being becoming more and more careful about what we said and how we said it because we realized, you know, it's interactive entertainment. What you put out there matters a lot. When I burned out in 1998, I pushed it, I pushed it all away. I said, I don't want to be part of this anymore, um, 98, 99, um, and spent the next several years doing like Deliria fairy tales for new millennium and some other stuff, reinventing myself. But then when I, even though I distanced myself from mage, I'd occasionally run across people who were like, you know, your game changed my life. And at one point I was, I was talking to someone, a friend of a friend uh, who had um, been born with uh, cerebral palsy. And I I asked him, I said, "I, I, I don't want this to sound I don't want to sound offensive or anything here, but how do you do it? Because, you know, I was watching the way his hands would jerk and so forth. How do you do that? How do you deal with that every day? And he says, well, I didn't want to fanboy all over you, but it was Mage. Because he said, Mage taught me that I had the ultimate control over my re- over my reality. That, that the things my body does influence it, but they don't define me. And really, from that moment onward, I'd been looking at mage as a sacred trust which is a really strange place to be considering that i didn't initially create it i brought a lot to it but the 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 initial idea ideas came from uh, came from other people and it never belonged to me you know i don't own the rights to it i don't get royalties none of us do uh it's work for hire so realizing that on one hand there's this thing that doesn't belong to me and never has and never will and on the other hand realizing that the things i bring to it the words that i put in the ideas that i and my people put into it change people's lives at some point it, it's it's heady you know <laughs> at some points it's it's scary and at some points it's it's definitely exciting it's flattering it's really humbling so picking it back up again after 20 years, <clears throat> well, it wasn't 20 years. It was more like, um, it was about 12, 13 years picking it up again at that point and working with, uh, uh, working with Rich Thomas on it. I was like, you know, I want to make sure that this, now that I know how much this means to people, I want to make sure that what I'm saying and what we're putting into it is is not only going to honor the people who have loved Mage for 20-something years, but that it's going to inspire people going forward. That's also one of the things that slowed down the process. I'm thinking a lot more, researching a lot more, and laboring, to be honest, a lot more over what we're putting out there than, than I did you know, when we were pumping out a book a month <laughs> for five years, because I feel it's a big responsibility. This is from Mosquito, who asked a question in line on Zcast, and uh, Mosquito says, Ceteris, I don't know if you can see what his, his message is, but he says, greetings from Greece. Thanks oh. for keeping oh, in contact hey. with the mage community. Despite the hard times you had lately, um, since we're going f- uh, for the basics, one of the things I'd like to hear is your take on the different views of the traditions <laughs> to the present world compared to how it was 20 years ago let's put it this way if we'd had the uh, if we'd had if, if we had had the the ability to talk with people and the ability to uh the the cult the <laughs> the cultural perspective that we have now 20 years ago things like <laughs> the, the akashic brotherhood and dream speakers would not fucking exist <laughs> uh those things have been the those traditions have been a perennial thorn in my in, in, in my side since 1993 because they're bloody awful. Um, they're awful because that's what happens when 20 something year old white folks <laughs> try, try and write about cultures they don't know and don't understand. We want to be inclusive, but we don't know what we're doing. Uh, <laughs> and you didn't so, have the internet like you do today. And we didn't have the internet like we did today. And, and that's before I go off on a huge tangent about that again, because I can't really address <laughs> it. Um, so the original Akashic Brotherhood was, you know, a, a really one-dimensional culture mash of of kung fu stereotypes and 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 badly understood Eastern mysticism. What we've been working on doing now within and and here's here's a a thing. I cannot alter the intellectual properties. That's the one constraint I've always had on working on Mage. 
I can change elements of them and I, and I can introduce new ones, but I can't say the Akashic Brotherhood never happened. I can't retcon the dream speakers. So we're, we're always working with the intellectual property as it was and trying to bring it into what it can be without actually getting rid of it. The Akashiana, and, and, and thank you for, I forget if it was Jess Hennig or um, Malcolm Shepard who actually brought us the, the Sanskrit version of, of, of what the word should be instead of Akashic Brotherhood, but the Akashiana, the Akashiana have evolved into and been retconned as much as I possibly can into a much more, a much more culturally, culturally accurate and culturally aware version of what they originally were. It's still a mess, honestly, but it's, it's the best we're able to do with it. The, uh, the Celestial Chorus are always the group that I had the hardest time wrapping my head around because I'm not a monotheist. I feel I, 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 I'll just short change, you know, short change it in, in, into, I feel that they are taking a more, these days are taking a, um, taking a more inclusive, less dogmatic viewpoint than perhaps they did back in the nineties. And our view of the way that, and the way they're portrayed is certainly less dogmatic. I mean, in, in first edition, they were essentially, uh, they, they, they were essentially Catholic fundamentalists who you know when you weren't looking would burn their fellow tradition members in in uh, alive in in catacombs under rome we we changed that <laughs> Jeez. um the cult of ecstasy the the this ahaya um that's definitely the group that i uh relate with most as is probably obvious um, mm -hmm. their original portrayal was a bunch of stone hippies and being as the 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 ecstatic path is probably closest to my real life my real life life as well as my real life beliefs they're now a much more complex view uh they, they're now presented as a much more complex group of people who gain enlightenment through trans through controlled transgression if that makes sense and they're definitely the group i've portrayed most sympathetically because oh fuck it i am one um <laughs> The dream speakers. Ouch. Ow, 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 ow. Uh, so originally presented as literally Bible, oh, oh not Bible, but uh, uh, drum bongo beating throwbacks in first edition. The, the dream speakers have always been my commentary on the, the history that we've built around the dream speakers. I've always been my commentary on how misapprehensions of, of, um, misapprehensions of, of, of maybe well-intentioned but ill-informed white people constrain and oppress people who aren't them. And in the 21st century, uh, I've essentially looked at, you know, especially the changing uh, dialogues and gone, so you know what, they're, they're really not putting up with your shit anymore. The primary source on a lot of our 20th cent uh, 21st century take on the dream speakers is, is my friend James High, J.H. High, who is, I'm going to say Apache, but... but uh, of course, I'm completely blanking on. Anyway, before I get, you know, anyway, it's, it's been James High, and I check in with, uh, I check in with James, and say, okay, where are we fucking this up? How can we do this better? And so I've made them more, much more activist in the in the their original presentation. They were basically a bunch of, oh, bongo, bongo, bongo. We worship the old way, you know, the old spirits, and we're you're just kind of you know peaceful, in touch members of these oppressed, colonialized groups and so forth. In the 21st century, I said, fuck it, you know what? <laughs> no, they're angry. A lot of people have not. I, I should say, a lot of white people have not liked that take on them at all tough <laughs> hmm. and uh, the euthana toy let's see <laughs> bad greek to start with the original concept behind the the uh, the thanatoics was they're spooky death mages they're like assassins who do voodoo and 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 worship death that was the first edition take on them and my my take on that when we started building the history around mage was like no and went into a, a, a combination of uh, again sometimes un misunderstood but as bad as well researched as we could do uh, at the time understandings of of um, tantra specifically but elements of hinduism um, combined with greek paganism which i'm more familiar with and making them more keepers of balance than um, sacred killers because of their early portrayal in first edition, uh, Kathleen Ryan and I 
and and uh, Porter Wiseman. I do not want to um, um, minimize Jay Porter Wiseman's contribution to that as well. We literally put the the Thanatoics on trial between the the uh, the presentation they were given in first edition and some of the early first edition source books and what we felt they should be. What they have really evolved into um, has been a more more culturally accurate mishmash of cultures that don't really fit together very well. Um, <laughs> Keepers of balance rather than mages of death. <laughs> uh, the Order of Hermes obviously has its has has its long legacy in uh, in Ars Magica, Magica. And when we sold the property, uh, the Ars Magica property, we had to legally divest ourselves of a lot of that uh, a lot of that baggage. Uh, a lot of that history, they had to become separate lines, and we we had this uh, this contract of what words and what terms you could use, and what terms went to the new owners, or we could use, and which ones could go to the, the new owners. The original presentation of the Hermetics was a bunch of stodgy asshole wizards, and what we especially with the uh, the revised edition uh, Order of Hermes tradition book, which I worked on. We took the opportunity to go. Okay, old generation is dead. What are the new gener? What is the new generation going to do with the idea of discipline, which is a a, a core element of the Hermetics? Discipline, command, control, and confidence, and scholarship. Take the idea of being the elite of the elite, doing new things with old roots, and making it less about you know the stodgy Gandalf mages that they originally used to be. Etherites. Oh yes. So the original concept of the Sons of Ether, which was grafted on there, the, the name was grafted on there toward the end of Mage First Edition's production run. As folks who've seen the original promotional materials uh, might remember, they were originally called Permitidians until Bill Bridges pointed out that Permitides' philosophy, Permitides was a, um, a Greek philosopher. Permitides' philosophy was actually the opposite of what the Sons of e of what the Etherites believed in so that name got changed at the very last minute to something um let's see uh sexist um <laughs> and and limiting the i the the contrast between or the rather the, the contested nature of sons of ether or society of ether has been going on since uh since bill and i did the first edition uh etherite tradition book and i favor the word etherite over uh, over sun or society uh of ether they originally began as Frankensteinian mad scientists with some some fifth, some pulp and some fifties grafted on there, and have have become more not just the steampunk mages, which you know that's kind of the obvious take on them, and definitely a part of the the twenty first century appeal, um, but also the the people who are trying to save one save the wonder element of science from the dogma element of science as represented by uh, by the technocracy, the verbena. Which again, bad Latin, but the Verbene, the group that I used to consider myself part of until uh, I worked on the Cult of Ecstasy tradition book, they're still the old school pagans. And when I say old school, I mean old, old, old school. Uh, they're probably of all the groups in, of all the groups between twenty be, between Mage First Edition and Mage Twentieth Edition, they're probably the tradition that's changed least, because. Though their original presentation was was wicked blood witches, Jackie Cassada, Nikki Ray, and uh, Sam Chupp and I do doing the uh, the first edition of Verbena book. We're all actual pagans, and so we did it as okay. So wicked blood witches is what you think. Hardcore, and I mean hardcore, the kind that would scare the shit out of most pagan, you know, most modern pagans. Hardcore pagans is what they actually are. We've brought in, especially over the last, especially in Mage 20, uh, brought in the element of techno-paganism, which is uh, something that barely existed in the 90s and is very much a part of modern paganism now with transhumanism and so forth. But uh, like I said, they're the group that's changed the least. And then there's the virtual adepts, which is people who've read Mage 20 know I, I favor changing their, their they favor slash I favor changing their name to something less 90s. 
the transhumanist ideal and the hacker ideal remain at the core of the group, but the idea of but the the definition of just what that means has changed considerably. Of all the groups in Mage, they're the ones who probably changed the most, because you know they were originally um, you know the the Mondo Wire two thousand guys back in nineteen ninety three. Thanks to Darren McKeeman, who is a real life hacker and the uh, the writer of uh, the primary author on uh, the the original Virtual Adepts tradition book, they were pretty authentic for 1993 uh that was 1993 this is 2018 and they've changed a lot and what i looked at them as very much as now is they're they're the the, the hacktivists they're reality hackers and not just sitting around at their computers wishing to dump the meat and ascend project themselves into the digital web but people who are using the uh, the influence of the internet to change the here and now in a physical way in a political way and an ideological way not just to you know ascend themselves but to uplift the rest of the world and obviously there's a lot of contention as there is in real life um you know in real life techno culture there's a lot of contention between the people who are like well i'm elite screw you and the people who are like, we have a responsibility to uplift the world. And that's a, a major element of, of the uh, the virtual adept slash Mercurian adept <laughs> today. Uh, I want to give a shout out to Eric Davis, whose book uh, Technosis, which came out in 1999, reaffirmed an awful lot of things that I'd been thinking through the 90s. I, I picked it up. I'm reading through it going, oh, my God, somebody else is thinking this shit. <laughs> Eric Davis in, in Technosis, he said that the god of the Internet would be Hermes. You're the god of the, the god of thieves and subversions who can be everywhere at once. And I was like, you know, he's not wrong. Obviously, <clears throat> hermetics already have that peg. So I went for Mercury as well as uh, taking the whole idea of Mercury retrograde and confusion, uh, yeah, confusion between people, and the idea of something being mercurial, you know, temperamental and, and and subject to quick change. I figured that represented my my modern take on the virtual adept better than the outdated term virtual adept. Anyway, so that would be the traditions. <laughs> well, a major thing before before I go off on too many tangents cuz I realize I've already run long here, but the idea of getting beyond the traditions was central to me for Mage 20. I felt even even in the 90s I felt like limiting the game to just the traditions was limiting the possibilities of Mage, hence the the addition of the crafts and the the idea of the technocracy as player uh, as potential player characters in uh, Guide to the Technocracy. In Mage 20, another primary thing which Rich totally agreed with was the idea that Mage should be bigger than the traditions it, and it should be bigger than just traditions versus technocracy. So the traditions, the technocracy and None of the above, as well as the disparate crafts, are all equally playable options. You're, you're not restricted to just being a member of the traditions. We have a comment from Fernando. Hello from Spain, Cetros. Oh, that's wonderful. We have an international audience. Uh, it says, Fernando here. I'm a huge fan. Mage oh, was you. way more than a game to me. It changed my life and uh, my whole perception of reality, expanded my mind, helped me through some hard times, and finally, it gave me the confidence I needed to become a writer. I can't thank you enough for it. Keep doing an amazing job and awakening new mages all over the world. Your words are more necessary than ever. Gracias. I really, really appreciate that. Thank you. This is, I'm, 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 I, I want, I'm going to take a moment to honor that because thank you very much. I really, you have no idea how much I appreciate that. This is a challenging job. <laughs> um, the 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 pay's not good and like i said i don't own any of it so a lot of times i spend a lot of time just banging on keys and and wondering what the hell i'm doing hearing things like that seeing things like that that makes it worthwhile that really means a lot to me thank you i appreciate that so much we also have a question from ernesto yip and his question is Hola. uh Hi, Ernesto. Uh, do you have any plans to make Mind's Eye Theater for a mage in the long future? That would be a White Wolf question or a uh, By Night Studios question. I'm not involved in that. I will say this, and here's another tangent, sorry. Um, I will say this, the the uh, probably the biggest mechanical change in Mage 20 involved the redefinition of focus. In Mage 1st edition, of focus was something a mage waved around to, to, to fool people into, th into thinking that what he was doing was okay. In Mage Second, I was evolving the idea that a focus was part of a bigger ma magic style. In Mage 20, focus is paradigm plus practice plus instruments. Paradigm, what you do. Practice, how you do it. Instruments, what you use while you when you do it. 
and the, all those things together are focus. I came up with that idea in 1998, shortly before I left Mage, because I was trying to think of a way to possibly make a Mage live action game that didn't involve three storytellers for every Mage player. <laughs> <laughs> and that was what I came up with. Because Mage and anybody who has ever even looked at the game, uh, much less tried to play it, recognized that the probably the biggest challenge in Mage, other than reading these gargantuan fucking books of ours, uh, <laughs> uh, has, is, is, well, if, if I can do anything, and the spheres, the spheres will let me do anything, then I can just do anything, right? That's a game breaker. Um, and as one I've lived with for 25 years... <laughs> And a major, a major redesign element uh, that that you know, I came up with with the, in the focus rules is: sure, you might potentially your spheres and your arete might allow you to do X, Y, Z, but do you believe you can do it? Why do you believe you can do it? What do you do to make what you believe come to pass? And what do you use when you're making that come to pass? That restrict in in, in addition to making it more like the way magic and metaphysics actually work as opposed to wishcraft. It's also a major character focus as well, but that's, um, I go into that a lot in Mage 20. Um, but from a practical game standpoint, that also makes it so that, you know, um, a person can't just wave their hands and magically turn vampires into soap bubbles to use that in, an infamous example from the old days. Um, oh, do you believe you can change a vampire into a soap bubble? So why do you believe you can change a mage into a soap bubble? So what metaphysical practice are you using to change a mage into a soap bubble? Do you have your magic your, your magic vampire soap bubble maker with you? No. Okay, you can't change the mage. You can't change the vampire into the soap bubble until you can answer those questions. That all came out of. So how do we possibly make this work in a live action uh, in a live action situation? I employed that that idea in uh, took that idea with me when I left when I left and put it into uh, Deliria Fairy Tales for a New Millennium and we realized that it worked. So when I came back to Mage in Mage Twenty, I brought it. In terms of are they are there plans to do it? I don't know. That's not that's not a question for me. I'm not involved if they are uh, beyond you know what I'm doing in Mage now and its influence on what they do. Once again, if you are listening to the show on Zcast, you can um, type in a message for us. And if you have a question, we'll respond. Or if you just want to say hello to etc., uh, feel free. So here are the last couple of questions. Um, Thomas Bordeaux had a question, but you've already answered yeah. it. So I'm going to move on to Tara's question. And she's on the Mage Ascension Facebook group. Hi, Tara. She says, I'm a newbie trying to digest these rules again. Mainly, I'm looking for an outline to a three-act structure to a game with so few boundaries. So how to prep basically is a question. Okay, good question. The way I run games is I make shit up. I wing it. I personally would have a hard time running a mage game in a three-act structure. However, to run mage in a three-act structure, uh, my advice would be the following. First, decide what themes you want to explore in the story. Uh, and that's pre-game legwork, both discussing it, the, the, the storyteller both thinking about it herself and discussing it with her players. And, you know, hash out what, what it is that you want to do. Come up with NPCs, you know, the non-player characters. Uh, come up with NPCs who both challenge the characters that you have. And also come up with your character group ahead of time really seriously. The idea of trying to build a, a chronicle around a bunch of mages and, and you don't know what those mages are before you hit the gaming table is that's disaster waiting to happen. <laughs> Come up with your character, your character group ahead of time and then structure the story around what your characters can do, what they can't do, be, challenge them on the things they can't do, create characters that present challenges to, uh, and you know, create NPCs that pre that create challenges for your player characters. The first act of a story is, Basically, the state of innocence, the, the state of, oh, well, we're just going along and this is who we are and this is what we do. The end of a first act involves taking the status quo, that status quo, and breaking it. Oh, we do this, we do this, we do this. And the end of the first act happens when, that's, when, when the we do this gets broken by the thing that brings in the second act. The second act is the facing the challenges and usually losing. The challenges begin to hit the mages, you know, that the characters in question, they have to adapt to the challenges. Sometimes they'll win, sometimes they'll lose. The point where they reach critical mass is the break in between uh, the second act and the third act. Something happens, a crisis occurs 
that forces them to change radically what they were doing and what they thought, you know, it changes the status quo radically enough that they, that they have to assert a new status quo. Asserting the new status quo would be the third act. So if you were doing this in terms of, uh, in terms of running a game, and again, I personally don't think mage is, is a good fit for a, uh, a linear third act structure because mage is not a linear game. But if you, if you wanted or needed to run it that way, your first act is going to have the mages doing whatever it is the mages do, you know, the status quo. Something comes in the, uh, at the end of the first act, beginning of second act, to radically change that status quo. The second act presents a number of challenges that alter them even further and drive them further out of their comfort zone. The break between act two and three presents a crisis where they have to change. And act three shows how they change and eventually succeed or fail and what happens as a result. Tara, that's an excellent question because I'm a newbie myself and these are some questions I had myself. So thank you. I talk about this in the uh, the storytelling chapter uh, of, uh, of Mage 20 as well. I write like an actor. Uh, My background is in theater and I was trained as a method actor in college and both as a writer and as a, uh, and as a, a, a storyteller, when I'm running games, I ask myself the four method acting questions. What do I want? What stands in my way from getting what I want? What will I do to get what I want to get around those obstacles and get what I want? And what happens if I do or do not? That helps a lot in terms of both designing characters and designing stories. We are down to the last question. It's actually a multi-part question from the storyteller for the Vampire the Masquerade Chronicle I'm in, and this is from Will. And you touched upon this earlier. He wants to know how are the foci, the foci, the foci, amongst uh, the different types fo- of mages balance. Focuses. <laughs> focuses. Focuses. <laughs> Thank you. It's, I get, as, as, I, as I said, and I think it was in the Book of Secrets, I, I break out in hives when people go foci, or when people go I'm going to wave a foci. Foci is plural. Foci is 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 grammatically true. I just hate that word with a passion. I prefer focuses, which is also grammatically true. Anyway, sorry. What was the question? All right. So let's go with focus. <laughs> he wants to know how the focus amongst the different types of mages are balanced. They're not. Uh, oh, okay. The balance in terms of uh, in terms of focus as a um, so again going back to twentieth here in twentieth anniversary you decide what your character believes and there's a bunch of paradigms presented in Mage Twenty and in the Book of Secrets, uh, which is the uh, the companion book to Mage Twenty. Pick a paradigm or pick several paradigms and combine them. You can do that, but you decide what your mage believes. Then you go okay. You choose a practice or, or a combination of practices that show how your mage takes their beliefs and puts them into action. And in the course of putting them into action, all the, the, the various different practices have a number of associated instruments. You choose your instruments based on what your, what your mage believes they're doing. There is no game balance in terms of weighing this against that. First of all, that would be absolutely impossible uh, because there are so many different groups in Mage. But also, ultimately, real magic doesn't work that way. A Catholic priest does not balance their practices and their tools based on what a ritual Kabbalistic magician does, uh, based on what a... um, what a Lakota medicine person does. The people use the instruments and the practices and the beliefs that work best for them. And in Mage 20, we expanded it beyond the, in first edition, there was a, an order of Hermes guy uses this for, for, for this focus for forces and this focus for life and this focus for correspondence. And that is not at all how real magic works. That's not at all how real metaphysical practices work. And it's really limiting from a character standpoint, especially in Mage 20, you, you choose the focus and the, the elements of focus on what your character believes. The element of game balance comes in because in the early stages you have to have you always have to have some degree of focus you always have to have the belief if nothing else but you have to have a paradigm you have to have at least at least one paradigm at least one practice and at least seven instruments at the beginning of play as your character progresses they can drop the instruments they've still got the beliefs but they can drop the instruments as they become as they grow beyond the need for the tools that's where the element of game, of game balance comes in. There's not a there's not a balance of etherite tools versus verbena tools versus alibatine tools versus iteration x tools. That would be I I don't even want to think about what a what a what a clusterfuck that would be to, to try and do that. 
there, so there isn't one though. <laughs> this is Will's last question. It's kind of a two-parter. He wants to know if mages were actually the Olympian gods, and if so, how did their stories actually go down, and what is the relation to biblical historical events? That's all on you. <laughs> <laughs> one one of the things that I have one of the things I, I have made a point of in Mage is not laying out a definitive history. There's a lot of historical stuff in Mage, but it's you, o- almost always couched in. Some people say this thing may have happened. This is what this group says happened. There are certain points certain moments where such so and so did such and such within recorded history but for the most part it's really subjective and as i was saying earlier in the podcast your game is your mage i'm not going to tell you that aphrodite was was a cultist of ecstasy if you want to have that aphrodite was a cultist of ecstasy which Aphrodite would, would actually be proto-cultist of ecstasy because the cult of ecstasy as a group dates to the 1400s. But anyway, if you want to say that, that Aphrodite was a cultist mage who had an affair with had an affair with Hephaestus, who was a high artisan, the predecessors to, to Iteration X, then go for it. Your game. It's your reality. I'm not going to dictate those things. There's a question that I got on my personal page. Uh, and I believe the answer is yes, but some folks have asked, will it? Will this podcast be available for playback later? Yes. Cool. In fact, I think it will go out uh, as a podcast within the hour once we end the show. So, And I will, of course, post this on Facebook and Google Plus and on our Twitter account. All right, we're going to wrap okay. this up. Uh, before we do, just oh. a couple comments. Um, sure. Mosquito says that uh, he's going to get a mage tattoo next week. Uh, I'm Aww. guessing that'll be the Aww. prime symbol. I could be wrong. And uh, Ernesto says, on a personal note, I want to thank you for writing Mage Second Edition. It was a great book, mm-hmm. and it let me see beyond the trappings of my, my society. Mage is about okay. personal choices and freedom and the consequences that come from those choices. Thank you. Fernando has another question, but you know what? Sure. I'm going to have to wait for another show because we've been going at it for over an hour now. So uh, before we go, I want to thank Lobos, Mosquito, Fernando, and Ernesto for their questions online. And for everyone who's listening on Zcast, why don't you hit the heart icon and give the show the love, some love. Mm-hmm. So uh, the more people who do that, more people will get turned on. And the fact that we had 31 live listeners for the first show is pretty amazing for the first show. And please tell your friends who are into Mage, uh, spread it out on social media, because I would really like people to get turned on the show. We're going to have a bunch of uh, other interviews and co-hosts. And of course, we'll have Sadros back again. Oh, uh, last comment, and then we're going to bring this to a close. This is Roland. It's another question. You know what? I'm going to uh, have to save these because this is just uh, too many questions. Oh, and also, hello from Brian Forrest in South Korea. Hi, Brian. Cool. Thank you. Hi. So we will do these questions on a future show. Yeah. So, um, Cedros, before we go, where can people find you online? I am online on Facebook under Phil Brucato. Thanks a lot, Facebook. It would be Sadaros Phil Brucato, but Facebook won't let me do that. I have an author page, Sadaros Phil Brucato on Facebook. I have a blog on WordPress, which is uh, Sadaros Phil Brucato on WordPress. I have a Patreon and <laughs> I'm, <laughs> yes. I'm going to do the, I'm going to pass the hat here. If you like what I do and you want to support what I do, please take a look at my Patreon. Uh, that's also Sadaros Phil Brucato. Mage is work for hire. I get paid a certain amount for a book and then that it is, it goes. I don't own it. I don't get royalties from it and I'm not going to be doing it forever. My Patreon is what supports me and my wife and our family and my other projects, the projects that I do own, the, the novels I'm writing, uh, my band, Telesterion, uh, which is a mystic rock band. You can find us on Bandcamp. Uh, our next album drops next week and supports my short fiction, my essays, uh, my game Power Chords, Music, Magic, and Urban Fantasy, which you can find on Amazon and on um, uh, and, and on uh, Drive-Thru RPG which is sort of a lower power take on mage by way of people who do, who do their music through magic. I rather do their magic through music uh, is very influenced by my, my own life as a, as in musical culture. But the point with Patreon is that is something that, that um, it's an income for me on a, on a month to month basis. The, the projects that I do for mage, I get paid when they go to press 
and sometimes that can be a long time. So for people who want to take a look at the Patreon, there are now several hundred goodies that people who support my Patreon campaign get. I update it at least once a week, and there's short fiction, novel excerpts, songs, demos, me noodling on bass, me reflecting on my creative process, and so forth. So check that out. Um, and that's uh, again Saros Filbrucado on Patreon.com. And I periodically show up at conventions and festivals. I love to meet folks there. I'm an extrovert, which is kind of weird for an, uh, for a writer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but but the best, and I spend a lot of time on the uh, the Mage Facebook group as well. And thank you, thank you, Shane, and everybody from the Mage uh, from the Mage Facebook group. And thank you, Joe. I really really appreciate this. Uh, well, I appreciate everything you've given us. Thank you. And thank you for everybody who's listening and everybody who will listen, everybody who likes Mage. And, and yeah, just thank you because I love what I do. It's definitely not the easiest job in the world, but I love it. And you all make that possible. And that's huge. I really appreciate that. Well, thank you. And as we wrap things up, uh, you can find me online at my website at josephaleo.com. It's a weird name. It's A-L-E-O, josephaleo.com. Or you can follow me on Twitter at josephaleo. And you can also find us at magethepodcast.com or follow us on Twitter at magethepodcast. And uh, come back again tomorrow. Uh, Subscribe to the show because my co-host Adam Simpson is going to be joining me. And we are going to be talking about the first edition of Mage. And of course, we welcome your comments. Cedros, thanks again for joining us. Sure. Thank you as well. Oh yeah, I'm on Twitter. I keep forgetting that. <laughs> yes. Let's not forget Twitter. I keep forgetting it. But yes, thank you, Joe. And thank you, everybody. And we'll see you again next time. Or hear you again All next right. time. Take care. Thanks. Goodbye, everybody. And goodbye, Cedros.